Here we have two people, one is a woman and one is a man, they are both wearing crowns and looking all important. What would you name them? I think many people go straight to calling the woman here queen, and we presume the man in the crown next to her is her husband. So what name would you give to a queen's husband? I think most people reach the conclusion this man would be called king, it's pretty obvious right? It's something we know and learn from a young age, reading stories of fairy tale lands under the reigns of kings and queens, though these are exactly that fairy tales. Here in the real world, things aren't that simple. Here we have the current queen of the UK and her husband. Her name is Queen Elizabeth II, while her husband is called Philip. However, he isn't called King Philip, which you might think. Instead, he is called Prince Philip, which sounds odd as traditionally a prince is the son of a queen, though Philip isn't the queen's son. That would be odd. Though the queen's husband isn't always called prince. The previous queen of the UK was also called Queen Elizabeth, and her husband was called King George VI. So, what is happening here? Why is the current queen's husband not called the king? Well, all this comes down to British traditions and which partner of the royal couple is actually of royal blood. In our current monarchy, Queen Elizabeth is the actual member of the royal family and her husband Philip is from another family. While with the previous monarchy, it was King George VI, our current queen's father, who was of royal descent, with his wife Elizabeth being from another family. So have you figured out the pattern here? The tradition goes that if the wife is the royal, then the husband does not become king. But if the husband is the royal, then the wife does become queen. Why is this? Well, it's for kind of the same same reason as to why wives take their husband's surnames traditionally here in the UK too. In English common law, the royal tradition is for a wife to take on the title of her husband. We saw this with Prince William, who upon his marriage received the title of Duke of Cambridge. This title transferred to his wife too, who is known as the Duchess of Cambridge. It's like this but on a much larger scale. A man becomes king, so this title is transferred to his wife, which makes her a queen. However, as wives cannot traditionally transfer their titles to their husbands, it means when a woman becomes queen, her husband cannot be transferred that title and become king. Though, when a woman becomes queen via the title being transferred from their husband, they're actually a type of queen called a queen consort. There are three kinds of queen. Queen consort, who is married to a king like we saw King George VI's wife Queen Elizabeth. Queen regnant, who reigns in her own right like with our current Queen Elizabeth II. And Queen dowager, who is the mother of a reigning monarch like once again we saw King George VI's wife Queen Elizabeth, who in her later life became known as the Queen Mother, while her daughter, the current queen, ruled. This means that this Queen Elizabeth was both a Queen Consort and Queen Dowager in her life. And this Queen Elizabeth isn't Queen Elizabeth I in case anyone was getting confused, despite the fact she was a Queen called Elizabeth before our current Queen Elizabeth II. It seems that Consort slash Dowager Queens don't get numbers even if they've been regnant Queens with the same names before them, but these number names are something we'll get onto in a bit. For now, let's look specifically at how the current UK Queen and quote unquote King got their titles, and what titles they've had in the past. Obviously, Obviously, Queen Elizabeth wasn't born with the title of Queen, she was born with the title of Princess Elizabeth obviously. Specifically, she was Princess Elizabeth of York. She was of York as her parents, who weren't King and Queen at her birth, were the Duke and Duchess of York. Much like we see how Prince William and Kate Middleton's children have the title of Cambridge at the end of their names, as they are the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. When her father did become King however, she lost the title of York, as her parents were no longer the Duke and Duchess of York, what with being too busy being King and Queen and everything. She simply became Her Royal Highness the Princess Elizabeth. You may be thinking that surely at some point she should have held the title of Princess Royal, which is the title given to the eldest daughter of the monarch. However, this title was already taken when she was born and wasn't really available to her when she became Queen herself. In 1947, however, she married Philip, and on her wedding day, much like we saw of Will and Kate, her husband was granted dukedom status. With this, he became the Duke of Edinburgh, and this transferred over to his wife, making her full title now Her Royal Highness the Princess Elizabeth. Elizabeth, Duchess of Edinburgh, which is just a bit of a mouthful. So when her father died, she got the much shorter and simpler title of her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II. Of course, however, as she was a woman, this monarch title did not transfer over to her husband Philip, who to this day is still Duke of Edinburgh, even though his wife is no longer the Duchess of Edinburgh. Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, was born with a very different title altogether, that being Prince Philip of Greece and Denmark, as he was born into those royal families. However, on his wedding day, he dropped this title and stuck with just the title he was bestowed on that day, Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, and like we mentioned, he is stuck with that title to this very day. 
and while Lizzie's monarch title couldn't be transferred over to him, he did still take on a new title when she ascended to the throne, that being Prince, specifically Prince Consort as is the tradition for husbands of royalty, giving him the title he still has to this day, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. It's interesting to note that the prince title he has now isn't the same prince title he was born with. Imagine being two different princes in your life, wild. But nevertheless, this explains to us why the current queen's husband isn't called the king. Though this isn't what everyone has wanted, there have been instances of queens wanting their husbands to be dubbed king consort as opposed to prince consort. A great example of this is with Queen Victoria and her husband Prince Albert. She wanted him to be dubbed King Albert as opposed to Prince Albert. In my head she wanted him to be called King Albert because of the other meaning of Prince Albert but I can't confirm that. However the British government denied this from happening. Apparently he was denied this due to the fact he wasn't British himself. So maybe one day in the future we may get ourselves a King Consort. But that does get me thinking. What is the next for the nomenclature of the royal family? Next in line for the throne is Charles, Prince of Wales. He is also the Duke of Cornwall which is a title he transferred over to his wife Camilla who is now the Duchess of Cornwall. She could technically also be the Princess of Wales too, however she has not taken on that mantle due to the association the title has with Charles's first wife, Diana. As he is a man and a royal in this relationship, it means that when he ascends to the throne and becomes king, his monarch title will be able to transfer over to his wife and she'll become Queen Camilla, well Queen Consort Camilla. And it also must be remembered that Queen Consort and Queen Dowager are just titles and do not bestow the hold with the same powers as the actual King or Queen. Well, to be fair, it's not like the actual King or Queen have those powers anymore really anyway. However, I've also read that she might not actually take on the title of Queen when Charles becomes King as apparently a lot of the public don't like the idea of her being Queen or something. I, I don't know. I think it's just some tabloid crap certain papers and other rags like to dribble on about. How the royal family covered in the media is crazy. They're treated like any other celebrity family. Most of the sources you'll find for this video from celebrity gossip sites. I think a lot of people outside the UK have this impression we are all obsessed with the Queen and the Royal Family, but in all honesty most of us just tend to get on with our lives. Anyway, it's more than just your title that can change when you become King or Queen, your actual first name can change too. When someone becomes King or Queen they take on something that is known as a regnal name. This takes the shape of just a first name with a number following it. This number represents how many royals have had this name already. So the current Queen of the UK her regnal name is Queen Elizabeth II, as she is the second queen to have that name, and when she became Queen Elizabeth II, the initial Queen Elizabeth retroactively became known as Queen Elizabeth I. She wasn't known as this name in her lifetime. It would have felt pretty presumptuous to have people calling you the first, even though you aren't dead yet. While Elizabeth is actually Elizabeth II's actual first name, this isn't always the case. Some kings and queens don't use their first name when they take the throne. Take Queen Vic. She was christened with the name Alexandra Victoria. However, upon her ascension, she decided to take on the regnal name of Queen Victoria. Many people actually think something like this may happen again in the future. When Charles ascends to the throne, he'll become Charles III. That's if he actually sticks to the name Charles, however. Many people have speculated that upon becoming king, Charles will abandon this name. This is due to not wanting to be associated with the two previous King Charleses. King Charles I is the only member of the British monarchy to be tried and executed for treason, and his son, King Charles II, was a renowned womanizer and ruled over Britain during the Great Fire of London, and a rather bad plague breakout. Charles's full name is actually Charles Philip Arthur George, and there'd be rumours that he may take on one of these middle names as his regnal name instead, possibly becoming King Philip, King Arthur, or King George instead. And I've only talked about the British monarchy in this video. There are many more countries than just the UK that have kings and queens. However, it seems that these title traditions are withheld by other nations. Denmark's current monarch is Margrethe II, and her husband is Henrik, Prince Consort of Denmark. Meanwhile, over in Spain, we have Felipe VI as King of Spain, while his wife is called Letizia, and she holds the title of Queen of Spain, so it seems that the tradition of the title only transferring from men to women and not the other way around is present in other countries, but this is only two examples from across the globe, so if I miss something let me know. However, I really like to think about what might happen with these titles in the future, and as these titles face ideas they haven't done yet, say the monarch was homosexual, what would happen then? In example, if a homosexual man would take the throne and become king and had a husband, would that husband take on the title of king consort as men can transfer titles to their partners? Like Likewise, if a homosexual woman became queen, would her wife become queen consort or not because these titles can't be transferred by women? We haven't had an openly homosexual monarch so it's something we just don't know yet. 
The closest we've had is with Lord Ivor Mountbatten, who married his partner James Coyle in 2018. While he is a lord, it doesn't seem like this title of lord was transferred over to his husband. And finally, what if the monarch was non-binary and didn't associate with either gender? Would we call them king, queen, or would a completely different word be created entirely? I've read that the neutral term for king and queen could actually be all kinds of things. It could just be royalty, monarch we've been using in this video, or even sovereign is a word that could be used. These are questions that may very well be answered in the future. On the whole, I tried to stay away from making topical videos. I like my content to be evergreen, which is dumb YouTuber talk for being able to watch at any time. E.g. a video about how the boroughs of New York got their names is still as relevant now as it was when I first made it, and it should stay that way, unless a borough is added, removed, or changes name. When this current event all started kicking off in the news, I wasn't really that interested. However, all of a sudden, names and titles came to the mix, and by gosh, my interest was piqued. Plus, it seems people really enjoy content about the royal family, so who am I to deny people such pleasures. So today, let's tackle the ongoing nomenclature conundrum that's taken up the headlines, that being the case of Harry, Meghan, their wish to step away from the royal family, and what that means for their titles. However, if you're watching this in the future, or have no idea of what or who I'm talking about when I say Harry and Meghan are naming issues, then maybe you should explain what's been happening. And just to be thorough, let's start from the very beginning. Henry, more commonly known as Harry, was born on the 15th of September 1984. He's the son of Prince Charles and Princess Diana, meaning yes, just in case you were really clueless, we were talking about Prince Harry, member of the British royal family and sixth in line to the throne, not just some random couple named Harry and Meghan. Though if you happen to be called Harry or Meghan and your partner has the other name, let me know how the past couple of years have panned out. Of course, since his birth, the world's media and garbage tabloids have been breathing down his neck, especially due to the death of his mother at such a young age. Over his life, Harry joined the military, served in Afghanistan and got caught up in a few antics himself, all of which were brought to the attention of the public thanks to media sources whose names aren't even worth mentioning. Though we don't really need to go into too much detail on all this, we really need to pick up this story in 2016, when Prince Harry was set upon a blind date of actress Meghan Markle by a mutual friend of the two. The two apparently fell in love very quickly, they wanted to keep their relationship private for some time. When Harry first confirmed the relationship, he explained how the media subjected his girlfriend to a wave of abuse and harassment. It wasn't until 2017 they were first seen together in public. However, this statement made by the prince didn't stop the media, as things would only get worse as Harry spoke of legal battles to keep defamatory stories out of the papers, and even reporters and photographers attempting to break into Meghan's home. However, this didn't stop the two from parting ways. In fact, this seemed to bring them closer together, and in November 2017, it was announced that they were engaged. Wedding preparations started to take place, and in May 2018, the wedding was held in Windsor. And as tradition holds, on his wedding day, Harry was gifted a duke title by his grandmother the Queen, with this title being Duke of Sussex. And of course, this transferred over to his newlywed wife, Meghan too, and she became the Duchess of Sussex. Of course, this wedding was covered extensively by the media, as was the birth of their first child, who was born about a year later in May 2019. As 2019 went on, it became more apparent that Meghan and Harry were unhappy with how the media had been treating them. Meghan is of mixed race, and many believe this has led to her receiving way more criticism from the media than other royal family members. Harry has even talked about how unconscious biases can lead to racist behaviour. BuzzFeed News even compiled articles from British tabloids on how they treated Kate and Meghan in the exact same situations. Christmas 2019 was spent as a family in Canada on an extended break from royal duties, and when we rolled into January 2020, it seemed like that break from royal duties would carry on, as the couple announced in January 2020 they would step back as senior members of the royal family, away from those duties, split their time between the UK and North America, and work to become financially independent, even saying they will pay the £2.4 million they received from taxpayer money to repair their UK home. On January 18th, the Queen and Buckingham Palace made statements on what the situation is officially with Harry and Meghan and their ties to the royal family. Buckingham Palace stated they are required to step back from royal duties, while the Queen said that Harry, Meghan and Archie will always be much loved members of my family. So it seems like the idea of them stepping back from the royal family has ended up with them stepping out of the royal family. As you can see from the time of events I've mentioned, this is all still very much a developing story. People are wondering what roles they'll actually play in the royal family, how exactly they are going to earn money for themselves, and of course, what will become of their royal titles. If they are stepping away from the royal family, then surely they can't keep using all those royal titles, right? Well, this is the big question we're trying to answer today, as in all of this, name's the only part I'm actually interested in. Well, titles, I ought to say. And I must say that while titles are on the line for both Harry and Meghan, it's primarily 
primarily Harry will be focusing on for this video, as most of what happens to this applies to Meg too, though we will cover some fun facts about her titles too. So what titles are on the line for Harry? Well his full official title is slash was depending on when you're watching this, his royal highness Prince Henry, Duke of Sussex, Earl of Dumbarton and Baron of Kilkeel, but we don't really need to worry about those last two, let's just stick with his royal highness Prince Harry, Duke of Sussex. What do these titles even mean and how does someone even require them in the first place? Let's look into that title of Prince first, it is defined as a non-reigning male of a royal family and in Great Britain a son or grandson of a king or queen. The word itself comes from the Latin princeps, meaning first man slash ruler, and this name came from the Latin primus, meaning first, and capre, meaning to take. So from here we can see this means the first to take, as in the first in line to take the throne. Now from this etymology and definition, I'm sure you can figure out how exactly someone becomes a prince. The easiest way to go about this is by having a monarch for a parent slash grandparent slash great grandparent, etc. However, you could also become one by starting up your own nation and declaring yourself prince, though other nations may not recognise this status. Duke is defined as the male ruler of a duchy and also as a British nobleman holding the highest hereditary title outside the royal family, so it's interesting to see that you can be a duke without having to be a prince, Harry just happens to be both. Duke too traces back to Latin, this time the Latin dux meaning leader. It seems that becoming duke however isn't as tricky as becoming a prince, of course being born into the right family can help as dukedoms can be inherited, however it seems a lot of the time they are bestowed upon people, most noticeably on their wedding days. This is a tradition in the royal family. On the wedding day of Elizabeth and Philip, Philip was granted the title of Duke of Edinburgh, William was granted Duke of Cambridge on his wedding day, and Harry was given Sussex on his wedding day too. Of course, these titles given to men were transferred over to their wives and they became the Duchesses of Edinburgh, Cambridge and Sussex respectively. Though of course, Elizabeth is no longer Duchess of Edinburgh as she is busy being Queen. We cover this in more detail in our Kings and Queens video. Why Harry was given Sussex? I don't know. No one else had the title at the time and the Queen decided to bestow it upon him. Though I do live in Sussex, so I guess he's technically my duke? The His Royal Highness, commonly shortened just HRH title, is perhaps the most interesting part of Harry's name. It seems to only be bestowed to some of the higher up senior members of the royal family. I read that George I really brought it into popularity, calling his children Royal Highness and his grandchildren just Highness, though this has since been dropped and just Royal Highness is used now, usually preceded by his or her. I also read that HRH has been given to non-royal family members in the past too, but as of now it's just direct members and their partners. Highness is actually a pretty interesting interesting word too, it's clearly a combination of high and ness, but what makes these raw people so high? Well in the past high didn't mean something being really upward, vertical, man it's really hard to define the word high without using the word high, but by the 14th century high meant most frequent or important, and this can still be seen today with the likes of the term highway, as the highway tends to be the most important and frequently used road. Royalty were called highness because they were so important, aka high. Though we don't need to concern ourselves too much with this title, as it's the HRH that Harry will be losing. The statement from Buckingham Palace says that the Sussexes will not use their HRH titles as they are no longer working members of the royal family, which shows just how highly regarded these titles are within the royal family, that makes sense as to why they are losing them. As I mentioned earlier, the HRH title is only used with the highest senior members of the royal family, and as Harry and Meghan no longer wish to be senior members, then I guess logically they should no longer have that title. Though I've been using the word lose and that isn't too accurate, they are choosing to not use those titles anymore, I'm sure this could be rectified by the Queen if they change their mind. In the fallout of this, it was announced they would now go by the names of Harry, Duke of Sussex and Meghan. And Duchess of Sussex, though this has caused some issues too, as this is the royal title formatting that has been adopted by women who have divorced a member of the royal family. When Sarah Ferguson divorced with Prince Andrew, Duke of York, she was known by, and still is known as, Sarah, Duchess of York. In an article from the 21st of January, which at the time of recording this was yesterday, it says that Buckingham Palace will reportedly revise Erinna's titles for Harry and Meghan. How they will sort this out we simply don't know yet. Though, what about his other titles, Prince and Duke of Sussex? Well, it seems that these titles won't be going anywhere anytime soon. Harry has no real reason to stop being a Duke. As I mentioned, there are many people with the title Duke who got it one way or another who have very little to do with the royal family. The current Duke of Norfolk, in example, has very little to do with the affairs of the royal family. In fact, I don't know how many people even know his name. If he is allowed to keep his Duke title, live a life of luxury and ease due to the family he was born into, and have very little media attention scrutinising his life, then 
then I think Harry can keep his too. Also, it seems that the Duke of Sussex title is going to make very good branding for the couple. It was reported in June 2019 that Harry and Meghan apply for the trademark Sussex Royal in the UK and hoping it could be trademarked globally. This would be for the use on books, clothing, social care services, stationery, education and charitable fundraising. Many have wondered how the couple will be financially independent and this title may very well be their answer. Though he could very well lose the title, it seems the most common way people lose the title is by ascending up the royal family. When Charles becomes king, his son William will most likely get his current title, Prince of Wales, losing his current title, Duke of Cambridge, that may go to his son George. However, this is very unlikely to happen for Harry, as his dad, brother and nephew are the actual succession to the throne. So, unless something happens to them, Harry will remain a duke. Though, what about his most renowned title, Prince? Well, yes, he will still be a prince. In fact, he can't really stop being a prince unless he somehow becomes king. It's something of a biological thing, as long as he is royal blood then that makes him a prince. No amount of wanting to step down can change that. Well, unless he isn't actually of royal blood. But if we went down that rabbit hole then we are no better than taboos that stoked that rumour in the first place. However, it seems like Prince is a title he doesn't actually use much anymore. Wikipedia states that it was his title before marriage, and now married Duke of Sussex is more the correct title to use, though he is still a prince if he uses it or not. It seems Harry isn't going to be formally known as Prince, so he won't need to change his name to a weird symbol anytime soon. Though, what about Meghan? Is she a princess? Well, yes, and no. We covered title transferal in way more detail in our previous King and Queen video, but to summarise, men of royal blood can transfer their titles to their wives, and as Harry is the royal, it means his title's transferred over to her, hence why she is Duchess of Sussex and formerly her royal highness. So while she is a princess, it's only because she got the title from Harry in the marriage. Technically, her title is Princess Henry. Nevertheless, she didn't seem to use the title too much anyway. Names and Titles aside, however, it seems the couple want to live a life away from the awful British tabloids breathing down their neck and from people constantly obsessing over them, and in that I truly wish them the best. Though I guess by making a video highlighting all this, I am actually part of the problem. Elizabeth II, also known by a full title of <clears throat> Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of her other realms and territories, Queen, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith, is quite possibly the most recognisable person still alive on the face of the earth. In fact, to many people, when you just say the Queen, it is Liz that comes to mind. Though maybe that's just me because I'm one of her subjects. Though it's for good reason as to why she is such a well-known figure. She has reigned over the United Kingdom and a variety of other nations for over 70 years. It makes her the third longest reigning monarch in world history, and she'll be number one in around two more years at a time of recording fingers crossed. Though despite how well known she is, there's something about her that isn't as much common knowledge. That being her last name. The debate over whether or not Queen Elizabeth has a last name or not, and what that last name even is, is an interesting one. So in celebration of Queen Elizabeth II's Platinum Jubilee, let's look into what exactly her last name might be. Well, the easiest way to find out that information is by going straight to the source, that being her birth certificate. Queen Elizabeth II was born at around 2.40am on the 21st of April 1926, and the name on her birth certificate reads Elizabeth Alexandria Mary. Now, while technically yes, Mary is her last name, as it's the name that appears last in her full name, that's not the type of last name that I was referring to when asking if she has a last name or or not. I suppose I should say surname or family name. You know what I mean. This kind of last name is completely absent on her birth certificate, which pretty much points us to the fact that she doesn't have a last name. However, the royalty do not function in the same way that the rest of us humans function it would seem. And despite the fact she has no last name on her birth certificate, that doesn't mean she doesn't have one at all, or at least the name she can use in place of a last name anyway. And this concept of being able to use a last name if they wish to doesn't extend to just Elizabeth II. But 
it relates to all members of the UK royal family. Traditionally, members of the royal family have been able to use the name of their royal house as a last name instead. Sometimes, however, royals have both a last name and a royal house name, which are not one and the same, however. So, what royal house does Liz belong to then? Well, this is once again where things get a tad confusing. The royal house Queen Elizabeth II is a part of is called the House of Windsor, but that hasn't always been the case. Initially, this house was called the House of Saxe Coburg Gotha. This house name ultimately derives from the German city of Gotha. You may be wondering, how on earth did such a German house become the royal house of the UK? Well, royal families all across Europe have long interconnected histories. You've seen Game of Thrones, I imagine. You know how intermixed royal families can get, for lack of a better term. Though the House of Saxe Coburg Gotha became the UK's royal house thanks to one specific German that being Prince Albert. Albert was a German man and part of the aforementioned saxe coburg gotha royal house in Germany. He however went on to marry Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom in 1840. While she was the one of British royal blood, her title didn't pass on to her husband as she was a woman and traditionally female royals do not transfer their titles over to their husbands when they marry. But when royal men marry women regardless of them being royal or not, the wife gets her husband's titles. It it's why Prince Albert wasn't King Albert, Philip wasn't King Philip, and so on. We explained this a while back in another video. This meant that when Albert and Victoria married, Queen Victoria did not become part of the House of Saxe Coburg Gotha, but stayed a part of the House of Hanover. Likewise, Albert didn't become part of the House of Hanover, but stayed a part of the House of Saxe Coburg Gotha. When Queen Victoria, however, died in 1901, her eldest son Edward took the throne, becoming Edward VII. However, he was not part of the House of Hanover like his mother was. This is once again where those pesky male-dominated traditions come into play. Like we see with non-royalty, traditionally, children take on the last name of their father. In the case of royals, children take on the royal house of their father, regardless of their mother being the actual queen or not. This meant that Edward VII was part of the House of Saxe Coburg Gotha instead of the House of Hanover, thus putting the House of Saxe Coburg Gotha on the throne of the United Kingdom. Edward VII would reign only until 1910. When he died, his son George V would take over as king and reign from 1910 to 1936. He, of course, ruled under the House of Saxe Coburg Gotha, too, like his father did. However, he only ruled under this house for a part of his reign as king. In 1917, something happened that made this extremely German name not too popular. That thing being, well, you know, the First World War. The United Kingdom and many other nations were at war with the nation of Germany, and many other nations too. This led to there being a lot of anti-German sentiment in public conscious at this time in the UK, and having a royal family with a distinctly Germanic name wasn't sitting too well with a lot of people. On top of this, a German aircraft called the Gotha G4 began bombing London directly. The name of this aircraft became public knowledge, and it having the same name as the British royal family did not not bode too well at all. As well as all this, over in Russia, King George V's cousin, King Alexander II, had been forced to abdicate and the Russian monarchy collapsed. This led to fear that all monarchies across Europe would be abolished. Suffice to say, being the king of the UK with a German royal house name, while being at war with Germany as well as knowing your royal family across the continent were being booted off the throne, meant that it really wasn't a great time to be king. The House of Saxe Coburg Gotha were having a bit of an image problem and something needed to change, that being the name of their house. So in 1917, King George V met with his Privy Council to decide on a new name for his royal house, and the name they decided upon was Windsor. This name was chosen because it already had very deep links with the UK royal family, with one of their main residences being Windsor Castle. The name ultimately comes from the town of Windsor, where this castle is, but more importantly, the UK's Legoland is here too. Windsor apparently comes from the Old English Windlesorlan, 
meaning bank slash slope with a windlass, with a windlass being a fancy apparatus used to move heavy things. So the monarchy of the UK are ultimately named after these things. I didn't expect that, but why not eh? Anyway, it was on the 17th of July 1917 that a royal proclamation was issued by George V, reading, Now, therefore, we, out of our royal will and authority, do hereby declare and announce that as from the date of this our royal proclamation, our household and family shall be styled and known as the house and family of Windsor, and that all the descendants in the male line of our said grandmother Queen Victoria, who are subjects of these realms, other than female descendants who may marry or may have married, shall bear the said name of Windsor. What you may have noticed in that proclamation, however, is that George V said that not not only is the house now called Windsor, but the family name is now Windsor too. This meant that Windsor could be used as a last name for future royal family members. Though according to the proclamation minus women, but that seems to have fallen from the wayside anyway. By the time King George V died in 1936, Windsor was secured as the name of the royal family and house. His son Edward VIII became king as part of the House of Windsor, but abdicated in less than a year for wishing to marry a divorced woman. Yeah, these guys like to keep things as traditionally as possible. As he had no children, it meant his younger brother, George VI, became king, still part of that House of Windsor. George VI reigned from 1936 up until 1952. When he died, he had no sons, so it meant that his eldest daughter became queen. That being Princess Elizabeth Alexandra Mary, who would become Queen Elizabeth II, who is still on the throne to this day, and to this day she is still a part of the House of Windsor. And as this can also be used as a last name, does this mean that Windsor is in fact the Queen's last name? Well, yes and no. Like I said, officially she has no last name, but if she really wants to use one, she can use Windsor. Though something else would throw a wrench into things here, that being the fact that she is a woman. If you hadn't guessed by now, the treatment of women in the royal family hasn't always been great. Royal women could only become queen if they had no brothers, and even then royal women could not pass their titles onto their husbands through marriage. Liz wanted to change things however. Before becoming queen in 1952, Elizabeth married one Prince Philip of Greece and Denmark in 1947. Upon marriage, Prince Philip of Greece and Denmark actually dropped these titles and took on a new last name instead. He he took on the last name of Mountbatten. This derives from his mother's side of the family, with their last name being Battenberg. He changed the name from Battenberg to Mountbatten once again due to anti-German sentiment in the UK at the time. They had only ditched the Germanic name of Saxe Coburg Gotha 30 years before this, and the last thing they needed was another German sounding name in the royal family in the wake of the Second World War. Elizabeth didn't adopt this name for herself however, breaking with tradition saying upon her ascension to the throne in 1952 that I and my children shall be styled and known as the house and family of Windsor, and that my descendants who marry and their descendants shall bear the name of Windsor, which pretty much solidified Windsor as the house name indefinitely, and her issue are all in fact part of the house of Windsor, despite the fact that they traditionally should have been part of their father's house of Mountbatten, like we saw when Edward VII took the throne after his mother Victoria. This doesn't mean that the name Mountbatten has gone away entirely however, in fact it became an official royal name again in 1960, just 8 years into the reign of Queen Elizabeth II. In 1960, the Queen's Privy Council declared that direct descendants of Queen and Phil should carry the double barreled surname of Mountbatten Windsor in honour of both of them. This however did not change the royal house name, the Privy Council specified that while the surname should be be different, the house name should stay as just Windsor. This means that descendants of Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip, like their kids of Charles, Anne, that one, and Edward, are still part of the House of Windsor, but use the last name of Mountbatten Windsor, as can their kids and their kids. Though despite Mountbatten Windsor being the go-to last name for their offspring, it doesn't seem like the Queen herself would use it, sticking instead with just Windsor, as her grandfather made it back in 1917. So it seems that the most correct answer for the Queen's last name is just Windsor, but you could kind of argue that it's Mountbatten Windsor and right 
thankfully she doesn't have to use her last name at all. Though some of you might be thinking that her last name might begin with R. This is because when she signs her name, she signs it as Elizabeth R. Thankfully to make things easier for us, this R in her signature doesn't relate to any potential last name. It instead stands for Regina, the Latin word for queen. Kings and queens signing their name with an R is a tradition of the British royal family that goes back centuries. It doesn't relate to her last name being Richards or Reed or anything like that. Though what's perhaps even more strange than the origin of her true last name are the many nicknames she has amassed over the years. Her most famous nickname is of course Lilibet. This came about from her youth as she was unable to pronounce her own name, saying Lilibet instead. Since then, those closest to her have used this name. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle even named their daughter Lilibet in honour of her. Though other nicknames include the boss, which is pretty self-explanatory, as well as things her grand grandchildren and great-grandchildren call her, range from Granny to Gangan. But apparently, Prince William as a child had trouble pronouncing Granny and just called her Gary instead. The former King Edward VIII referred to her in letters as Shirley Temple in reference to her curly hair. But the strangest nickname has to be the one Prince Philip would call her, that being cabbage. This apparently derives from the French phrase of mon petit chou, meaning my little cabbage, and Philip would call her that in affection. Very sweet, but very strange. So happy platinum jubilee cabbage. Cheers for the extra days off. September 2022, Queen Elizabeth of the United Kingdom, after 70 years on the throne, died. And while she may be gone, the crown continues. Her heir apparent, also her eldest son, became king immediately after her death. I'm referring to the man who is now king of the United Kingdom, Charles III, and yeah, that's still really weird to say. I say weird to say because for so long, the current king of the UK was known by a completely different title. A title he has had since 1969, which means I am many other people have only ever known him by this title, that being the title Prince of Wales. Now I must admit, I and many other people I've spoken to during this time of history had just presumed that Prince of Wales was an honorary title exclusive to Charles, something for him to have while he waited for his time on the throne. But that is not the case at all. When Elizabeth died and Charles became king, that title of Prince of Wales was shortly bestowed upon Charles' eldest son and the new heir apparent. Prince William, and it was in this moment that I and many others came to a realisation that Prince of Wales isn't actually just a title made to keep Charles occupied for 50 plus years, but is in fact a title with a plethora of history behind it. And it's a title that always goes to one person in particular, that being the heir to the throne of the United Kingdom. Also fun fact, the title of Duke of Cornwall goes to the heir too, meaning Charles was Duke of Cornwall too, but has also passed on to Will too. This means Will is now Prince of Wales, as well as Duke of Cornwall, Cambridge and Rothsey, very much like Thanos collecting the Infinity Gems. Though we aren't interested in those titles, just the title of Prince of Wales today. While many of us have only ever known Charles to be Prince of Wales, this is a title of a long history and many bearers, from actual Princes of Wales to the heirs of the English then UK throne. But why is it exactly this title of Prince of Wales that has been bestowed to the heir apparent to the British throne? Well, a lot of this has to do with the actual relationship between the nations of England and Wales themselves. I'm sure you're all aware by now, but the United Kingdom is a country made up of four countries. But the histories of England and Wales within the UK are a lot more intertwined than say the history between England and Scotland, or Scotland and Northern Ireland. A great place to start with understanding the relationship between England and Wales is with the flag of the UK, the Union Jack. This flag is meant to represent the four nations of the UK, but as many have pointed out, there is a lack of Welsh representation on the flag, which sucks because a dragon plastered over the Union Jack would be awesome, as dragons make everything better. The reason the Welsh flag isn't represented on the Union Jack is because when the United Kingdom first came into being in 1707 with the Union of the Kingdom of Scotland and Kingdom of England, Wales was already well and truly a part of the Kingdom of England. This meant that Wales was represented on the Union Jack via the Red Cross of England. Soliloquy has a much better video explaining all of this in more depth. Go watch it. Nevertheless, this helps show us the conjoined relationship England and Wales have with one another. Even today, England and Wales are administered as one jurisdiction. 
though of course Wales has not always been so closely tied to England, and even in these modern times the two nations have a degree of devolution between them. Wales has an incredibly strong national identity, which is best seen with the Welsh language, which was made official in 2011, and is seen along with English on most major signs in the nation. This Welsh identity dates all the way back to the age of Roman Britain and prior to it. The area we now call Wales was dubbed Cambria by the Romans, and came under Roman rule much later than other parts of the island. And when the Romans left and the Anglo-Saxons claimed much of the land, many native Britons fled to the wilds of Wales and held onto their Celtic roots. This allowed the Celtic culture and traditions to flourish, which helped create the modern Welsh national identity. This was the case in other far-flung parts of the island of Britain, which didn't come under as heavily Anglo-Saxon or Roman influence like Cornwall and Scotland too, which still have strong Celtic identities. This allowed Wales to flourish in its own unique way, and it's because of this that Wales became the kind of state it is perhaps best known for being, a principality. If you couldn't guess by the name, a principality is somewhere that is governed by a prince or princess. There are actually a handful of principalities still on our globe, including the likes of Andorra and Liechtenstein. And yeah, the Mushroom Kingdom should really be the Mushroom Principality. Just saying. Wales was too once a principality. Well, again, kind of. An area of modern Wales was dubbed the Principality of Wales, with the other areas being their own things. This has led to the modern popular belief that the entirety of Wales was one big principality and still is, which isn't the case at all. But the nation is very well known for being one in the past, and has been heavily linked with princes for centuries. This is the first step in explaining why there is a Prince of Wales to begin with at all. The Principality of Wales was under native Welsh rule from 1216 to 1283. It was in that latter year of 1283 that the Principality of Wales came under rule of the English Crown. This was via something called the Statute of Rufflan, which claimed that parts of Wales were under English rule. This slowly expanded until the entirety of Wales was under English rule. It actually stayed as its own thing but under the English rule until 1542. It was in this year that Henry VIII enacted the Laws in Wales Act. This made Wales fully part of the Kingdom of England, as opposed to its own thing but under English rule. And then by 1707, the Act of Union in Scotland came to an effect, with Wales as a part of England as we mentioned. So how did Wales from this moment carve out that much larger degree of independence that it has today? Well it wasn't one defining moment. Over the years bits of law came into place that gave Wales a stronger degree of devolution. Prior to the First World War, demand started to grow and then this demand picked up again after the Second World War. This amplified in the 40s and 50s, and by 1964, Wales was given its own Secretary of State. Then again in 1967, the Welsh Language Act came into effect, and then by 1999, Wales finally got its own National Assembly now called Senef. Then, finally in 2011, as well as the language getting recognition as mentioned, the International Organisation for Standardisation recognised Wales as a country. That's a very brief and oversimplified history of Wales, but what it shows us is the relationship between England and Wales within the UK, and sets the scene as for why the heir to the UK throne becomes the Prince of Wales. Before being claimed by the English Crown in 1283, the Principality of Wales had its own native actual princes running the shots. The earliest of these princes known to us is one Glufuf ap Sinan. The last active Prince of Wales was one Dafid ap Glufuf. His reign as Prince of Wales came to an end in 1283, when he was beheaded by the English before conquering their land. This meant that Wales lacked a prince of their own. The rule of England at this time was one Edward I. Just under 20 years after his conquering of Wales in 1301, he decided that there should be a Prince of Wales once again. However, not a native Welsh prince like it used to be, but instead one of his own, specifically his English son. Edward I gave his son, also called Edward, the title of Prince of Wales. Bequeathing titles to younger family members is a very common thing in the English British royal family. Prince William was gifted the title of Duke of Cambridge and Harry was gifted the Duke of Sussex. With Wales now part of the Kingdom of England, it made all the sense in the world to gift it to another royal in the form of a title. On top of this, Prince of Wales was already an established title and had a degree of prestige in the land. 
Plus, how better to assert your power over recently acquired land than to make your son its prince? Anyway, when Edward I died, his son Edward Prince of Wales became king, being dubbed Edward II. This set the precedent for the heir of the throne to be dubbed Prince of Wales. Though, funnily enough, Edward II's heir, who will become Edward III, never actually became Prince of Wales. After him, the tradition got picked up though and became cemented into place that the heir would become the Prince of Wales. And since then, none of these Princes of Wales have actually been natively Welsh, which has created some friction to say the least. Many Welsh natives have historically been unhappy with their prince being someone who isn't Welsh by any means. The most recent former Prince of Wales, the current King Charles III, has something of an interesting relationship with Wales and his former title. He was given the title when he was 20 years old in 1969, and upon receiving the title, embedded himself into Welsh culture. He left Cambridge University to attend a term at Aberystwyth University to learn all things Welsh, and and perhaps most importantly, learn the Welsh language. Since then, he has attended various events in Wales, and upon becoming king in 2022, he did his inaugural speech in Wales in the Welsh language to show his tie to the land. What's also interesting is that the heir apparent does not automatically become Prince of Wales. As mentioned, Charles didn't get the title until 17 years into his mother's reign. King Charles III was much quicker in giving his heir, Prince William, the title however. In his first speech as king, he announced that William would be the Prince of Wales, with his wife becoming the Princess of Wales, a title the new Queen Consort Camilla did not use but Charles's first wife, Diana Princess of Wales, became very linked with. And while there's always an heir to the throne, there is not always actually a Prince of Wales. Charles was the first Prince of Wales for a little while when he received the title. Before him, the last Prince of Wales was King Edward VIII, prior to being king of course. When he did become king, he had no children, so no direct heir to dub Prince of Wales. Edward VIII famously abdicated however due to his marriage with Wallace Simpson, and with no children it meant his brother became king instead, that being George VI, the father of the late Queen Elizabeth II. With no sons, his eldest daughter Liz was heir to the throne, but despite being the heir, she was not dubbed Princess of Wales. This is because her father believed that Princess of Wales was a title that should only be reserved for wives of the Prince of Wales, and should not be a title unto itself, basically blame the traditional patriarchy of the monarchy. Since then, things have changed. Most noticeably, the firstborn of the monarch now becomes heir regardless of their gender. While we seem to have nothing but kings on the horizon, perhaps if Prince George were to have a daughter first, she would be dubbed Princess of Wales. Or maybe by then the monarchy will be abolished, who's to say? What I can say for sure is that King Charles III's time as Prince of Wales has come to an end, and it was a long reign as prince. Only history knows how he will be remembered in his reign. And perhaps more importantly, only time will tell what kind of Prince of Wales Prince William will be. Discussed in quite deep detail in the latest Name Explained video, the former Prince of Charles is now King Charles III due to the death of his mother, Queen Elizabeth II. While this is a huge title change in the world of the UK royal family, it is definitely not the only title change that has happened with the death of Elizabeth II. Her death has seen a whole plethora of title changes with the higher up members of the royal family. Names and titles that we've been familiar with for decades are suddenly gone, replaced with new titles that may take some time to get used to. To. However, not everything has changed amongst the royals of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Some titles we've all been familiar with for so long are still being used. So to wrap up this week of royal content, let's look into all the other title changes that have happened in the UK royal family due to the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Of course, to begin with, we have Prince Charles losing his title of Prince in favour of King, which we're all well aware of by now. While he was Prince of Wales, he was also Duke of Cornwall and Rothsey too, which are titles he used more often when he was in the southwest of England and Scotland respectively. These titles he also abandoned when he became king, along with the title of Prince of Wales. Charles has been covered extensively, but what about his wife Camilla? Before her husband became king, she was most well known for using the title of Duchess of Cornwall, which she received through her marriage to Charles. This is interesting because Charles didn't use the title of Duke of Cornwall all too much, using Prince of Wales much 
much more. While Camilla could have been the Princess of Wales, that title was not used because of its deep links with Charles's first wife, Diana. But all this doesn't matter too much anymore anyway, as with her husband being king, she has now become queen. Well, kind of. She isn't the same sort of queen Queen Elizabeth II was, Liz was the Queen Regnant, meaning she was queen in her own right through ancestry. Camilla is now known as Queen Consort. A Queen Consort is the title the wife of the king gets, when it's the king who is the actual monarch by blood. While dubbed the queen, being a Queen Consort does not give the Belle the title the same power as the King or a Queen Regnant. It's more a ceremonial title, and her main role will now be in aiding her husband the King and supporting him. It was actually somewhat debated if Camilla would use this title prior to her husband becoming King. Many thought that she wouldn't because of her and Charles's past marriages. Divorce in the royal family was once a much larger issue than it is now. However, this idea of her not being Queen Consort was put to rest in February 2020, when Queen Elizabeth II herself gave Camilla her blessing to use the title once she had died, which we are seeing happen now. So while the UK will still have a queen, it will be a very different kind of queen. While that's the title of the new king and queen covered, what about the new heir apparent to the throne? This is of course Prince William. When he married Kate Middleton in 2011, he received the title of Duke of Cambridge to be used in England and Wales, Earl of Strephon to be used in Scotland, and Baron Fergus to be used in Northern Ireland. Though despite having all these titles, he is best known as the Duke of Cambridge, which made his wife Duchess of Cambridge. Though now he is heir apparent, he has been given the title Prince of Wales from his father. This is the title that traditionally belongs to the heir apparent. I literally just made a whole video on the subject. He has also received his father's other titles of Duke of Cornwall and Duke of Rothsey. But according to Wikipedia, Charles has a boatload of other titles too, which have all now automatically gone to World 2, and this includes the Earl of Carrick, Baron of Renfrew, Lord of the Isles, and Prince and Great Stuart of Scotland. However, unlike his father, it doesn't seem that Will has relinquished his former titles, meaning he is still Duke of Cambridge, among other things, as well as having all these new titles inherited from Dad. Will is giving Commodus a run for his money in the amount of titles he has. Though despite hoarding titles in the way a dragon hoards gold, it seems that William will most likely just be known as the Prince of Wales, with that title now taking priority. But we also have his very own family too, his wife Catherine, more well known as Kate, and their three children of George, Charlotte, and Louis. What has become of their names? Well, Kate, as the prince's wife, has received all the titles her husband gets too. This means she is now going to be more commonly known as the Princess of Wales, a title which, as mentioned, the previous wife of the heir apparent did not use at all. As for their kids, well, prior to Elizabeth II's death, they were George, Charlotte, and Louis of Cambridge. It's worth... <laughs> I've written ducks instead of du dukes. That's quite funny. <laughs> it's worth highlighting that they weren't the Dukes or Duchess of Cambridge, but rather of Cambridge, which signified they were the kids of the Duke and Duchess themselves. It's a minor difference, but apparently a big deal. Having the word the in your title is a pretty big deal, and something they don't have yet. But logically, with their mum and dad now most commonly going by the titles of Princess and Prince of Wales, it now means the kids will be known as George, Charlotte, and Louis of Wales. Though I also read they might use the last name of Cornwall and Cambridge, Bridge. But this seemed to just be a theory from prior to the Queen's death, and Forbes, who were claiming this, used the Daily Express as their source, which is a garbage newspaper, so maybe don't read too much into it. We then have Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. Their whole title situation is somewhat up in the air anyway, with their decision to not be full-time royals. We made a whole video on that subject way back when. In regards to Liz's death, however, it seems that neither of their titles will be changing. This is due to the fact that he and or his wife are directly in line to the throne. They will remain Duke and Duchess of Sussex. What's more interesting, however, is the fate of their children and their titles. Their two children of Archie and Lilibet had no royal titles at all. They instead had actual last names of Mountbatten Windsor. Despite being the kids of a prince, they never received the titles of prince and princess. This is due to a latter patent issued by King George V all the way back in 1917. This declared that the titles of prince and princess could only go as far back as grandchildren of the king or queen. As Archie and Lilibet were Queen Elizabeth's great-grandchildren, they did not fit that criteria. 
However, Liz's other great grandkids, William's children of George, Charlotte and Louis, have always been called princes and princesses. This is due to the fact that they were direct in line to the throne, as their dad was second and now first in line. But now, with Charles as king, it meant they are grandkids to the monarch as opposed to the great grandkids of the monarch, ergo valid for the titles of prince and princess. However, whether this will happen remains to be seen, due to Prince Harry no longer wishing to be a full-time member of the royal family. King Charles has plans to slim down the monarchy with less key players, so there is a chance he may change the rule so Archie and Lilibet are not prince or princess at all. And even if this doesn't happen, they might not use the title anyway. It's still a developing situation. Situation. By the time you're watching this video, they may very well be a prince and princess. Queen Elizabeth, however, had more than just one son. She had four kids all in all. These were Charles, Anne, Andrew and Edward. What has become of the three siblings of the new king, Charles and their titles? Well, there hasn't been as much change on this front. Her eldest daughter Anne has had the title Princess Royal since 1987. The title Princess Royal goes to the eldest daughter of the monarch. As Charles only had sons, it means that she got to hold on to that title and will most likely hold on to it until her own death. The next potential Princess Royal is William's daughter Charlotte. When William becomes king, she could very well receive this title as she is the eldest daughter of the monarch. King Charles's brother of Andrew however, well he is still the Duke of York but he might end up losing that title too. But that's for a completely different reason and has nothing to do with the death of his mother. Though he and his ex-wife did receive custody of the Queen's Corgi so that's something little things. The biggest potential name change for one of the king's siblings is with his youngest brother of Prince Edward. He is currently the Duke of Wessex, but he might receive the title of Duke of Edinburgh, a title most deeply linked with his late father of Prince Philip, who used it as a namesake of the program for young people to ensure them to explore nature and help with their local communities. I'm more than happy to admit I never did the DOE because of a lazy, fat child. Phil would be disappointed. But when he died in 2021, the title automatically went to Charles, who was still prince at the time. But when he became king in 2022, he dropped this title. However, he didn't pass it on to William, it just ceased to be, meaning there is no current Duke of Edinburgh. So why might Prince Edward be the one to end up with this title? Well, on his wedding day, it was promised to him by his mother that when Philip died, he would become the next Duke of Edinburgh. But this never actually happened. It all depends on what his older brother, King Charles, wishes for now. He could make his brother the DOE, but as mentioned, he apparently wants to slim down the monarchy, so maybe not. I personally feel, however, that Charles will make someone, possibly Edward, the Duke of Edinburgh, solely because of the aforementioned Duke of Edinburgh program, which needs an actual Duke of Edinburgh to hand out those sweet, sweet gold awards. And of course, Anne, Andrew and Edward all have children of their own, some of which also have grandchildren like Princess Beatrice and Princess Eugenie. It seems that none of their titles will be changing anytime soon, simply because they are so far removed from the line of succession that they don't come into play in this last shift in the UK monarchy. But from what I can gather, this is all the major title changes that have occurred due to the death of Queen Elizabeth II. This is undoubtedly a huge time of change within the royal family, and a huge moment in history I'm sure many of us will remember, whether it be due to the funeral itself, the ascension of the new king, or just because of that damn cure. Things are definitely different now and the UK and the wider commonwealth faces its next chapter, one without Elizabeth on the throne. I'm sure however we will all get used to it soon enough, as well as get used to all these new royal titles. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna stop talking about the royals now. Name Explained depends on viewers like yourself supporting the channel financially on Patreon, so a huge thank you to everyone who does. Donating just $1 a month helps the channel amazingly and gets you bonuses including ad-free videos, exclusive content and the power to request ideas to be made into actual Name Explained videos. $2 a month gets you all that plus your name here with all these awesome people. Visit patreon.com forward slash Name Explain or click the link down below to find out how you too can support the channel. Thank you. Thanks for reaching the end of the video. Why not watch another and subscribe to keep up to date on all things Name Explain? You can find myself on Instagram where I'm Name Explain YT and join the Facebook group Friends of Name Explain to talk with myself and other name nerds. All of that will be linked down below. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and once again, thank you all so much.